Uh, Exodus chapter 17, and it's the water from the rock, and also it's a passage about the first battle that the people of Israel had to fight under Joshua. So Exodus chapter 17, and let's hear God's word. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, who am I? What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the people because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites, said Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. And we pray that the Lord would add his blessing as we have read his word today. Amen. As I was mentioning, uh, really today we're reflecting upon times when we might fall into doubting whether or not not the Lord is with us, those occasions that might give us uh, reason to doubt. And Maybe because of what happens, uh, those things can happen in certain particular situations. But doubt is, or suspicion is, a a very difficult emotion to deal with. I came across a a little story about Lord Halifax, who was a prominent British politician just before World War II. And during World War II, he was on a train journey back home from from London. And being aware of the the journey and knowing that he was about to go into a very dark tunnel, there were two very prim sisters sharing the train carriage with him. And as they went into the dark tunnel, he took the back of his own hand and rather loudly and repeatedly kissed and slobbered over the back of his hand. And then as the train uh, exited the tunnel and came into the railway station and he was making his exit, he got up from his seat, he took off his hat and as he addressed the two prim sisters, he would say, I should like to thank whichever one of the two of you that was for that most charming incident during the tunnel. And the two sisters were left fuming at each other, looking at one another and wondering which of the two it was. But doubt is not good. Suspicion is not good. And today we're going just to be reflecting upon a situation, in a repeated situation in the life of the people of Israel. I mentioned a moment ago we could 
go into a lot more detail about these passages, but we will, as it were, just be hovering above them and seeing the sort of general thrust and the flow of these two chapters. But I think from our perspective today, we could see that the kernel of the question being in chapter 17 and at the end of verse 7. It's that question which is simply, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord with us or not? Paul, writing in the New Testament, actually gives a bit of a commentary on this early incident in the, the, the life of the Israelites. That was in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And if you were able to read that passage, what you would notice as Paul writes there is that he gives the impression that what is significant for the nation of Israel is that, that actually they all had the same experience. They all left Egypt together. They all crossed the Red Sea together. They all had the experience of God delivering them together, and they all came out of that together. They all saw the miracles that God had provided. And even though all of them witnessed that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, he goes on to say, but actually, God was not pleased with most of them. And that was despite the fact that they had all experienced the deliverance, that they had all seen God at work, that God was not pleased with all of them. And I think it's very easy for us to be very hard on the nation of Israel as if we would have been different. And where we're trying to look at in this passage this morning, I think there's three situations where people might doubt and we're going to see this in the, in the life of the, the nation of Israel. And maybe the first one I could maybe describe as this, three times of doubting. And the first one I've simply described as when we're pushed out of our comfort zone. I'm thinking here about the, the story of the manna and how God provided bread for them, as, or something like bread in the morning that they were able to eat. While they were back in Egypt, yes, they were slaves, and they were deeply unhappy. But there's a sense that even looking back at that, they can do so with a sense with rose-tinted spectacles and saying at least when they were back there, there was routine in their life. They had as much food to eat as they needed. And certainly as you look at chapter 16 and, and verse 3, that's exactly what the nation of Israel were saying. It says, that the Israelites said to Moses and Aaron, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, because there we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you, you have brought us out into this desert to starve. And they'd forgotten all about the misery, and they'd forgotten about God's deliverance and the fact that God had always provided for them, and here they were whinging about everything. Now, as we try and make some degree of connection between the Israelites where we find them and maybe our own lives where we are right now, I think it's thinking maybe in terms of being when you are pushed out of your own comfort zone, that maybe that's somewhere where you are currently, that God has moved some, or moved some aspects of, of your life around. So whether it's in your, your working life, whether it's to do with your family, it's a change of some nature, or if it's not immediate, it's something maybe that you've come through, or maybe, again, something that you're likely to encounter in the not-too-distant future. And even when you come through all of that uncertainty, and it is daunting to be able to deal with that, it's even worse when you might consider that actually the reason that you are going through this uncertainty and all this that's upside down is because God has led you into that. And it's very hard to rationalize when it seems to be that you've been following God and still things seem uncertain for you. And it's in those moments particularly that doubts begin to surface when you are certainly out of your comfort zone. But the lesson, I think, of the manna, if we're just 
trying to stand back from this passage and see what the manna was really about. Because as you noticed, reading that passage is that what the big lesson of the manna was is that God provided for them each day. Because the manna was new every morning and they had food at night. But they couldn't keep any of that until the next day. If they did, it melted away or it had maggots in it. And so the lesson that the nation of Israel had to learn is that each day they had to trust God. And then on the next day, they had to start all over again. And they had to trust God for that day and indeed the day after. And that's, I think, a hard lesson for people like us, isn't it? For people like us who are used to trusting ourselves, trusting our efforts, trusting what we have stored away in pots or what we have stored away in banks. And yet the lesson is that you need to trust God each day and in that day trust him so that you don't know any more than one day at a time. So when you're out of your comfort zone and you would rather have everything fixed so that you know what's happening and you know what God is doing, that's not the way God works, but God says, trust me for the day. And maybe an, another story. This time we're thinking it's the, the water, how God provided water out of that rock because now the people are literally again in the desert and this time they're there without water. Chapter 17 and verse 2, again they're quarreling with Moses and they say, give us water to drink. That's the cause of their grumbling and their grumpiness and their groaning. But the key is chapter 17 verse 7. It's that underlying question which is enabling the people to put into words, is the Lord with us or is he not? Because that's the question that all of us face, isn't it? And maybe as we begin to make connections with that story and our lives today that we might think about that maybe in a spiritual context, that maybe we're, when we are in the desert spiritually, you might be able to compare yourself with other people. You look at someone else in here who's following God and it seems to be going great with them. They're, they're being blessed by God. That they, You can see the evidences of God's blessing upon their lives and yet you look at your life and it feels that your relationship with God is a little bit more dry. It could, you could describe that as being spiritual spiritually dry or barren in the wilderness, whichever one you, way you wish to describe it, so that you would again be more ready to ask the question, is the Lord with me or not? Because in these moments, I'm struggling to believe that God is with me. And the amazing thing about how God dealt with the nation of Israel here is that even though they didn't deserve the water in that sense, because they were grumbling and they were complaining. And that's why Moses took it so seriously. They weren't just simply grumbling against Moses, but it was against the Lord himself. But God graciously provided for them. And God will graciously provide for us. That's the lesson of the water from the rock at a very basic level. But as we continue to carry on with those situations of doubt, when people might doubt, and I think when you might doubt whether the Lord is with you or not, and as the second half of chapter 17, I've simply described this, is when the nation of Israel are under attack or when you might feel that you are under attack spiritually. This is the first time that the nation of Israel had their armies to be used under the command, being as Joshua as their commander, but where, I ask you, did the real battle take place? Was it down in the valley 
when the Amalekites and the Israelites fought each other because surely you are directed to what was happening up on the hillside because up on the hillside Moses was told to go up there and Moses in that sense was told to intercede and so that he was told to raise his staff and as long as his staff was, was raised the Israelites were winning as soon as he grew tired and his arms fell down the Israelites started to lose and so beside him Aaron and her were able to lift his arms up and he was able to persevere and we've got the sense that those three guys together were interceding, praying, as it were, on behalf of the people down below. And so it's a reminder of the importance of praying. And it's a reminder for all of us how we ought to be praying, not only as individuals, but as a church. And we've been offering you, even in recent times, about getting some more help uh, about that course that's coming up in a few weeks' time, about how we might actually be able to pray for interceding for other people, praying for God's help and God's grace and God's strengthening for people, because this passage reminds us is that we are called to pray for one another. Now, that's three situations where we might actually doubt. Is the Lord with me or not? And we can see in each of those situations one of them might be more particular to you. But there are moments in life, just because of the way life crashes in on us at times, that the first question that's in our heads is, is the Lord with me or is he not? That's the question the Israelites constantly asked. That was the root of their problem because that's where their doubts expressed themselves. And part of the way in which Moses continually answered that, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, was the importance of remembering what God has actually done in your life. That's why in this story, we repeatedly see what Moses does. And when they go through a place, a physical location where God helped them, they built a pile of stones so that the next time round they went past this spot, they would remember what God had done. When God fed them by manna, Moses also tells them to take some of that manna, put it into a jar, and that jar would ultimately go into the Ark of the Covenant, which would go into the temple and would be as a physical reminder of how God had helped them. After the battle in chapter 17, at the end of that, Moses tells them, write this down so that you will remember what happened and how God helped you and how God brought you through. It's remembering what God has done for you. I've already mentioned Paul writing about this commentary, as it were, on, on this season in the nation of Israel. And in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, Paul actually goes on to say is that these things were written down by examples, as it were, to encourage you so that you might remember how God looked after these people. And that's the purpose of the Bible. That what we actually have when we have God's word in front of us is that we have, as it were, something tangible, something physical, some, somewhere to which we can turn and that we will find God's help and God speaking to us. And that in this word, we have all these examples, we have all these stories reminding us of the importance of how God is with us. So when we're struggling and when we have these doubts and when we truly wonder, is God with us or is he not? We are looking to what God is saying. I have already said today, we can be too hard at times on the nation of Israel. Because when we struggle, when they struggle, and we can laugh at the nation of Israel. And we can say these guys were pretty poor followers. Because, and we can laugh at them because if you look back at chapter 15, Ex or Exodus chapter 15, which was immediately after the story of crossing the Red Sea, they're full of praises. I mean, look at chapter 15 and verse 2. They were singing this, this song which says, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. There they are. They're excited about what God is doing. They're singing about that. And then just 
literally a few weeks later, they've given up on God and they're complaining and they're gurning and they're, they're saying, God, I doubt that you're really with me. Are we any different? Are we? Because we're here on a Sunday and we're praising God and we're getting excited about what God has done in our lives and maybe just two or three days later, we forget what God has done. And doubt and fear are very human emotions. And yet recognizing the reality that that is a human emotion. I want to leave you with some encouragement today. Some encouragement today that will remind you where your ultimate needs are met. Because that, I believe, is where this passage actually focuses us. It is where this passage ultimately points us. When we're thinking about this water from the rock, what is it really about? And going back to what Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 5, you can get your Bibles, you can look at it, but Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 5, he says, that rock, that rock was Christ. Because that's where the Bible always points. It's always pointing to Jesus. And if there's one lesson that's really out of this passage, what the provision of the water from the rock is trying to say to the nation of Israel is that God is the one who provides for them. And ultimately, Jesus is the one who provides for us fully and completely. It always points to Jesus. We may not get all that we want, but Jesus will give us all that we need. He gives us our identity. He gives us a sense of fulfillment. He gives us our forgiveness. And above all, he gives us life. If we are wanting to entertain any hope about heaven, about eternal life, we will know that the only place that we will find that is in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Some of us at times may be tempted to look for satisfaction in our wealth, but we know that that can disappear. We may be tempted to look for satisfaction in our careers. And even if we have the best career possible and everything goes as we would want it to go, ultimately, even that terrific career is going to end in retirement. Some of us may be tempted to think in in terms of satisfaction, in terms of admiration from others. But ultimately, at some point, you will disappoint them. They will disappoint you. Some of us may be tempted to find our satisfaction in, our, in a relationship, but again, at some point, someone will annoy us. We will disappoint them. And even if all of these things work terrifically for you, at some point, your own life will go and you will die which is why we need to remind ourselves that our ultimate satisfaction is in Jesus Christ. And it is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the greatest demonstration of the love of God because Jesus went there and he went there for you. And he bled and he died and he gave his life for you. He endured all that mockery. He endured all of that so that you might be saved. And how do we respond to all of that? I've got two little points up there, I think, with which to conclude. What these couple of chapters ultimately remind us to do is that we need to trust in God's daily provision. That's the story of the manna. It's the story of the water. God will give you what you need. And even when you are doubting and even when you are anxious, you need to constantly go back and remind yourself is that God will give you what you need. And ultimately, what you really need to trust in is the provision of God's Son to meet your deepest needs. We can't afford to live without Jesus. He's the salvation that God has offered. It's what we need more than anything else in the world. And I encourage you and implore you to meet Jesus today if you haven't already done so and to know that Jesus is your Savior and that you will follow him and to do that trusting in him. Let's pray together. Let's, let's pray. Our Father, there are many occasions whereby we, we doubt, and we're full of worries, and we're full of anxieties. 
We trust in ourselves rather than you. And today, oh God, we want to lift our eyes and we want to look to you and we want to find in you the answer to everything in this life and beyond this life. Lord, show us Jesus. Help us, enable us, give us the strength to trust Jesus so that no matter what we endure, those doubts, those uncertainties, that we will follow where you are leading. Lord, grant us your spirit. Be near to us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.